Hi everyone, happy new year, happy 2024. Welcome to another episode of Redirection with Terry Curl. And before you get excited, no, this is not Redirection with Terry Curl season three. This we are going to call a very special feature. It is a special edition of the Redirection podcast. And let me explain how. Now, for many of us, those of us who, of course, live in Jamaica or who are a part of the Jamaican diaspora, we're very familiar with Sajikor Group and the Sajikor Foundation and all of their philanthropic initiatives and efforts across health, education, and sports. Now, every single year, they do a great job at bringing in a particular speaker that is meant to really motivate and inspire internally. Now, my granny, Jeannie Baby, you guys know her, the Scorpio, 92 years old, taught me to strike while the iron is hot. And I want to thank Sajikor Group for extending this courtesy and allowing me to sit down with the guest who will be showing up in the redirection seat. There's so much I want to share about her. She is philanthropist, education activist, serial entrepreneur. She owns 16 companies, real estate developer, commercial, residential. She's a mentor. She's a mother of five. And oh, by the way, she just happens to be Jamaica's richest woman. That's right. Dr. Trisha Bailey, the one, the only, the phenomenal, the incomparable, is squeezing out some of her time to be in the redirection seat. And I cannot wait to start the conversation. Let's go. This special edition of the Redirection with Terry Carell podcast is powered by Sajikor. Dr. Bailey, Dr. Trisha Bailey, because we have to put some respect on your name. Welcome home and welcome to the Redirection seat. Oh my God, I'm so excited to be here. How Thank are you so you? much for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have you. I'm amazed. I'm, I'm I feel great. No, I see that. I feel and, great. and if I may, uh, it's interesting. I grew up in the 80s. So I'm a common entrance baby, okay? We did maths, English, and mental ability. And when I grew up looking or hearing about a black woman, entrepreneur, philanthropist, billionaire, the only person I probably could have thought of was Oprah. And so the moment I had the opportunity to sit with you, black woman, Caribbean, entrepreneur, mentor, maven, maverick, mother, mighty woman of God, Jamaican. You have to understand that there is a different level of pride that I feel having the opportunity to speak with you. So you heard all of those words, all of those descriptors. Little Trisha. A little girl. Little girl who grew Woodland. up in Woodland, St. Elizabeth. Did she see her life ending up here? Never. Talk to me Never. about her. So my grandmother said, dream so big that not even you believe that those dreams can come true. And that's exactly what I did. Jeez. I would have never. Sometimes I, I sit around and I pinch myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's really me? <laughs> it's, it's still, it still has not. It's surreal. It's, it is surreal. I've watched interviews. I have read articles. And you have said, you know, you had your outside toilet you said, you know, your outside kitchen, so chances are we're using either coal pot or we're using wood fire. You speak about your homes um, being uneven, you know, what we would have called shacks. But you said you were happy. I was happy. Talk to me about that idyllic way of living, even though you were poor and not even knowing I was poor. You know, my grandmother was the kindest person I've ever met mm. in my life. Um, she is epitome of joy yes and she injected it in all of us she made sure that every one of us we supported each other we loved each other so as a child all i did we play i fought a lot because <laughs> i was a family fighter yes and we remain in, in injected in each other my family's still like that today mm -hmm. i think it's a part of the country you know being being jamaican yes you know one love one regardless, love. in regardless, spite one, of. In spite of, one love. And I think it's so different when you look at um, even children now that are, are privileged, not all, but those that are privileged who, if they don't have a certain phone or if they don't have certain things, there's a discomfort, they're unhappy, they're bored. And I think that there's a different kind of simplicity yeah. uh, of that joy, that happiness that you said you experienced. Um, and talk to me about grandma. So in your book, and by the way, you added author, <laughs> recently minted author of your of your book Unbroken, you speak about your grandma walking 
25 miles and packing up the donkey with her produce and having to sell. Talk to me how that sacrifice has helped to shape and mold who you are today. You know, my grandmother, she, she passed it when she was 79. I was 30 years old. And I have never heard her complain a single day of her life. She would, every evening she cooks, mm -hmm. she would, all the children from the community shows up. And I watch her not having a meal. She drink the pot water as her meal because she wanted to make sure that every person, every child that she touches, there's so much love injected that mm -hmm. it cannot be denied. So for me, it, it formed my heart and my soul because all I saw growing up was kindness and love. And not having the resources, mm -hmm. it didn't it didn't phase me. I, one, I didn't know that there were supposed to be other resources. <laughs> that there were options, right? That this options. wasn't it. But being in being raised by her and my aunt um, that continued to raise me. My mom was in Kinston working, so she could send money back yes. to, to the country for us. It has formed a certain level of discipline and work ethic. Because that's all I knew. That's all I knew was hard work. Oh, I believe you. And while I, I, I read your book, and a lot of your story resonated with me because I grew up with my mom. I grew up with my grandma. We're now four generations of women because I have a daughter as well. And so listening to how it was the matriarchs, the women yeah. who really helped to form who you are, I think that's what really you know stood out to me. But let's talk about the transition. So 13, you drop in the great United States of America. And for many of us, it's, it's milk and honey, and you describe it as being, you know, this amazing place. How did you adapt, considering your 13, new culture, new scene, and was it all it was cracked out to be at that moment? It was definitely not what it was cracked out to be. <laughs> so, as you know, they tell you that the roads are paved with gold, gold. and I got to New York, and it was dirty and stinky. <laughs> And you're like, this is what I leave Jamaica for. This is what I, but I didn't know any different because mm -hmm. I didn't have a TV. So I didn't know, I didn't have magazines. Yes. I didn't have anything to dream other than whatever I created in my mind. And getting to the United States, the, my life became hard, difficult mm -hmm. because I started going through a certain level of pain as a child that no children should ever have to go through. Yeah. But I thought that this, oh, is this America? I guess this is America and I have to just adapt. And you just have to be resilient and you have, have to, to work resilient. it out. You, you spoke about, and you mentioned it, and I think uh, it is something that you also speak about, you know, writing this book, releasing, being vulnerable, and sharing parts of you that maybe many people would have crossed paths with you and they would never have known. This is what Dr. Trisha Bailey has been through. Um, briefly tell me, simply because this is redirection and we want our viewers to understand that no matter what your circumstances are in the present, they don't necessarily dictate where you'll be going in the future. Talk to me about some of the trauma that you have had to not only live with, but to heal from and how that has impacted how you operate as the woman we know today. So it started, my, my trauma started, because as a child, 13, being in Jamaica, I was, I was happy. Yeah. And it started two days when I got to America. And my home wasn't safe, mm -hmm. so I had to figure out how to not be home. And by figuring out how not to be home, I started doing sports. Yes. And I just happened to be really, really good at running. Well, you said, you mentioned it, you said you were always running in Jamaica, you ran to the corner shop, you ran to all of these different places. Um, for persons who are watching, especially women, girls, who recognize that, that their family isn't uh, safe, any, any words or any space that is safe for them, any words of advice um, to them? And if you would like to actually share maybe what, has, what, what, what you experienced. So, since I don't want to give away the book too much. Mm, too much, not too, too much, much. Not too much. So... When I came to the United States, I had a stepfather whom I just met for the first time mm. in my life and not knowing, I, I, was, I was at the maturity, mental maturity of probably a five-year-old. So even though I was 13, I wasn't developed. And he, he became a prey. And I was, I was, I was who he latched onto. Mm. And he took full advantage of my innocence and the fact that my mother was always working. Of course. So... If you are someone, if you're a child or anyone who is dealing with that circumstance, find someone that you trust. Mm -hmm. Find someone that is going to help you and help to protect you because there's always someone. Do not hold it in. There's no secrets to be kept because mm -hmm. the people who are horrible are 
who make sure that you're not safe, they will always may tell you that it's a secret. It is not a secret. Mm -hmm. And there are people around you who would protect you and care for you. So find that person and share whatever trauma it is that you're dealing with. Because you should not have to deal with that at all, or you should not have to deal with that alone. Absolutely, and it's certainly not your fault, no matter what they say, it's yeah. not your fault. So you found track, and you actually became a super, superstar, like super athlete showing up on the cover, I think, of your local newspapers, a real superstar. And you are transitioning now to the University of Connecticut. You guys call it UConn. UConn, Huskies. And the Huskies. The Huskies. <laughs> and you get the opportunity, but you, 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 you share in terms of, you know, you got that, that scholarship and that was your chance. Yes. That was your chance to succeed, to get on level footing. Talk to us about that. So you kind of gave me my first chance of mm -hmm. success. And when I was coming out of high school, I was, I could have passed the SATs to qualify to actually run in college. Gotcha. And they figured how to get me the full scholarship that I needed because if I didn't have a full scholarship, I couldn't have gone there. And they, they did everything that they could to be able to support me in this, in, in this journey of mine. And because of that, I am forever indebted and so I recently went back about a year or so ago, two years ago, and I made a large donation to the university. The largest. The largest. Single donation, yes. <laughs> the largest <laughs> single donation in athletic history. And the reason why I did that is because I want a narrative to change as it relates to women that look like me, children who look like me. Because in America, they give the white boys and white girls an opportunity, and they'll give them grace because mom and dad might be the next large donor. Of course. And there's not a lot of people who look the like generational me who, support. Who, who will actually make large donations. Mm -hmm. So I want when some, they look at a child that's on campus that may have made a mistake, that look like me, that they say, you know what, let's give them a break and let's help them to get past this so that maybe they will be the next Trisha Bailey who comes and be able to support our university the way that you should if they do greatness for you. That is absolutely wonderful. I think um, for me, it's the, it's the fact that we see a lot of people who, who climb that corporate ladder. They do very well. They make a lot of money. But the community building part, the sending the elevator back down, the, the idea of saying, I don't want to be the only one up here. I yeah. want to bring more people. I think that is what makes your story uh, yeah. so different and uh, you know I really have to thank Sajikor, uh, the group the foundation the alignment that they have with you because over the years Sajikor group has really worked in the pillars especially through their foundation for health mm -hmm. education and sports and so I find that your philanthropic initiatives and efforts also fall within the, the pillars of sports and health and education um, so you get the scholarship, but before we move on, you said you just could not pass the SATs. Yeah. Let's just stick a pin right there. <laughs> because there's so many of us who can't get past the failure. Right. We can't get past the point of, I didn't qualify, so I don't deserve to be here. I didn't qualify, so even if I do get the opportunity and the door opens for me, I probably won't be able to really make any use of it. How were you able to avoid making the fact that your SATs would have really caused an issue in terms of you qualifying. How did you avoid it making you feel diminished as a person? So I always said, even in high school, I used to always say all the time, whatever is worth having is worth working for. And I've always been less focused on the positive, my strengths, and less develop the weaknesses. Yes, ma'am. So what I did in college, and I think that I really it's like my second year in college is like the light bulb kind of went off. It's like I started doing so much additional work so that I can build the skills that I did not have. Mm. And then when I did that, I was now building my weaknesses while focusing on my strengths. And that's how I am today. Because if you continue to focus on what yesterday was, you'll never have a positive tomorrow. Absolutely. Listen, can I just get a word? Can I get a word? <laughs> amen, amen. So you... Do UConn, you graduate, you make history, you become a stockbroker, you're working for, I believe it was Solomon Smith Barney, yes. that is now Mor Dean Morgan Stanley, Morgan Stanley. Yeah, really. and you became history, uh, or you created history, I should say, as being the youngest stockbroker 
in the company and you're working hard and you're moving up. You're the only African-American woman in all of New England, but you're doing well. Your performance is up because you are someone who says you gun it. You gun it. Talk to us about that approach, that standard of excellence that you had while transitioning from university slash college to the professional world, which is not always very easy for, for any of us. So I've always been a very confident child, mm -hmm. young woman, and I knew that once I got that opportunity, and especially the track, you have to finish the race mm -hmm. and you have to go as fast as you can. You come out the blocks, you gun it. And I've always taken that approach to my life. So when I started as a broker, I was in the office. I was the first one in the office every night. Yes, I was the last one to leave every night. I, I did everything. I was in the car. I was obsessively about my profession. I listened to audio tapes. That's all I did. Every morning I wake up, MSNBC, because I need to do a market. <laughs> then I did all. The, so everything I did, I was like, I got to give it everything I have. Because the only way for me to know if I'm good at it is to give it everything I have. My goodness. And I do that now, today. Wow. And how did you navigate the space as black woman, um, Jamaican, Caribbean, immigrant? That space can be very, very tricky. So you're working your tail off, but then you get to the, st the, 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 the state where you are allowed to do an interview or you're invited to do an interview that will get you to your next level. But then what? So the thing with being a black woman in America, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy thing, mm -hmm. all right? But I've never focused on race. I, I put so much effort in everything I do that even if you don't like me as a black person, you're going to see how excellent I am, and it cannot be denied. So I, I am one of those people that I am a glass half full. Yes. So I'm always positive. I always see the positive in the situation. And sometimes I don't see the negative until sometimes it's a little too late. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make your work. You're going to make your work and your performance do all of the talking. Yes. But even though you're doing very well, you decide to become an entrepreneur and you became the entrepreneur of entrepreneurs. What was the catalyst? What was the trigger? What made you say, you know what? It's time for me to bet. So I mean... <laughs> I was, I got promoted. Mm -hmm. I transitioned to pharmaceutical industry and I got promoted every year. Wow. And my last promotion, I was, uh, at the time I was finishing my doctorate, I had my MBA and my cardiology and pulmonary um, degrees. And so they hired me. I was number one in the company. They hired me without a formal interview and their standard policies to interview you. But because of all my accolades, they the hired me. Ones. And they approved everything that I need to prove where you have to live because they also do that as well. So I transitioned to California and my first meeting with my boss, he, it was a lunch meeting and he said, oh, I didn't know you're black. And I said, oh, well, yes, chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> and I, did, I didn't think anything of it, to be honest, at the time. But a week later, he started disapproving all the things he approved. And at that time, I was like, they the guy I was with at the time said to me, why are you working for someone when you have all these degrees? You have so the knowledge. I have the knowledge and I have the know-how. And at that time, I decided to start my first business, which was a medical recruiting company. Was it scary? I know you say you're oh. confident. And I mean, a lot of us even walk into rooms and we're confident about what we know and our expertise, but boo-boo, baby. I was terrified. <laughs> Talk to me because we have a lot of entrepreneurs and startups in the community who want to take the plunge, but they're still kind of scared because they don't really know if they should. How did you manage fear and how did you manage to get on the other side of it as you transition to being your own boss? So I managed the fear by working extra hard. Mm. So at this point, I started a company and I was like, I have to be successful. And I was literally working 20 hours a day, sometimes even 21 hours a day. I, it's like, I just kept every little win I was celebrated, even when it wasn't like a money win. Because the first six months, I only made $15,000. Only? <laughs> For the entire six months. For the entire six months, I only made $15,000. Yeah. And on the, on the eighth month, I made, it was close to a million dollars in that one month alone. Because I, I kept on going, kept on going, kept on putting the effort. 
And the scary thing about when you start as an entrepreneur is the fact that you don't have some, a lot of people don't have safety nets. Yes. I didn't have a safety net. So I know there was no possibility of failing because I didn't have anyone to rely on because this, which means I would now fail in this and I would have to go back to corporate America. And I didn't want to do that. That was not an option. Not so an option there's no me. plan, no, there's no plan yeah. B, no plan C. So you have, you are a boss. You have like 16 companies. You have stakes in Jazz, the Hornets, the Suns, uh, Hawks, excuse me. You uh, are in real estate, commercial, residential. You are in medical equipment, supplies. You are in pharmaceuticals. You have 46 pharmacies across the United States of America. You are a mother. You are doing all of this. You're building all of this. But, but why, why medical? Why equipment? Why supplies? Why was that the important niche for you in terms of even how you view the world and in terms of giving back? So it's, it's actually going back to starting mm -hmm. of being an entrepreneur. So now I started being an entrepreneur and it's stressful. It is, it is as stressful as you can imagine. And but I'm working hard. And I got to the point where in 2008 that I did not want to live anymore. Mm -hmm. It was too much. I couldn't handle it. And so and you were a mom at the time? I, I was a mom at, at the time, my five-year-old. And I remember... I woke up from the coma. I was in the coma for eight days. I was transitioning from California to Florida. I was wheelchair bound. My larynx was clipped so I couldn't speak. I got to Atlanta. They escorted me off the aircraft. They placed me in a corner. Three hours later, I'm trying to get someone to help me. Crying, no one helped. And a young girl came over to me and, and decided to help me after three hours hmm. to get to my next destination. And at that point, I realized that the disabled was invisible to the world. And I never want another person to ever feel the way that I did that day. So my company, our focus, our core value is to make sure that each of our patients and each person that we touch their lives, we inject so much love and kindness into them that it cannot be denied. And you've touched a, a huge part of me and I know my community is going to be like that's the alignment um, it is something that we speak about and I use my platform about a lot in terms of people with disabilities the the lack of of regard yeah. and respect and treating them with integrity and dignity yeah. and honoring them as humans who can yeah. and that they have rights and I think it, it's unfortunate that it took you having to experience that in order to say you know what let me now be someone who can be a change maker in that particular um, in that particular space and niche for the elderly, for the disabled. How did you reconcile with not wanting to be here anymore, not thinking that there's any more value, understanding who you are and what you have worked for and how far you've come and what you've had to celebrate, but getting to the breaking point of saying, I'm not enough and this is it. How do you reconcile with that after? How do you heal? How do you move on from that? So after that, I, when God said, I don't want you right now. Amen. You have some things for you to work on. Amen. I remember I was home and I was in the shower and the warm water beat in my soul. And my five-year-old came to the shower door and she said, Mommy, I don't want you to die. And when she did that, I... I said, my strength is within me mm -hmm. and I will find it so that I will make sure that I can make a change, yeah. not just for her and all the rest of my five children, but also for the world and young women who look like me or anyone who has ever had the thoughts yes. of not wanting to be here. Mm -hmm. So, Is this beautiful, Natalia? Yes, that's oh, my beautiful. I love Natalia. her. I tell you, I, I've been following your story. Um, <laughs> What advice do you have with therapy? Because we are Jamaican women, we are in the Caribbean where therapy, even though we are speaking about mental health and we are speaking about um, the, the importance of therapy and not being afraid to say, go to therapy or that I am in therapy. What's your advice or your experience with therapy in terms of healing and dealing with trauma to not pass it on, pass it on to partners or to, to children? So because of my um, degradation, as a teenage, teenager, um, when you go through those type of traumas as a young person, what happens is that you carry it over into your relationships. And what you think you're running from, you end up running to because you just cannot see 
you cannot see because the trauma is making all those decisions for you. And so I did, I started doing talk therapy in 2010. And so I did 10 years of talk therapy. And I got to the point where it's like, I was like, I have to make a different choice because I keep running into the same horrible people that I'm trying to run away (laughs) from. The cycle keeps on, kept on going. And my therapist says, you know, I think you should do what's called EMDR therapy. It's not non-talk therapy. And I did. And I did EMDR therapy. And what EMDR therapy does is basically think about you being in a room. Mm -hmm. And you walk in the room when you have trauma. You have a tiny flashlight. The only place that you can see is where the flashlight functions. That's it. That's all you can see is where the flashlight shines. After you do EMDR therapy, you can the entire room lights up. So now your world changes. And now your trauma is no longer making decisions for you. You're making them for yourself. Mm. And as a result, I am, I, am, I am with the most amazing man now. I love it. And I am the happiest I've really ever been in my entire life. I'm so happy for you because my next question would be when you are climbing, when you are confident, when you are a go-getter, when you are a woman who knows what you want and you are extremely tunnel visioned, you like to say that you're tunnel visioned, sometimes it's extremely difficult to find a partner who doesn't want to out your flame but wants to fan it, who wants to be behind you. How or what advice do you have for women who right now are in difficult relationships where men feel as if they are not as powerful as you because you make more money, perhaps you have more network or more net worth. Um, How do we navigate that space? So I think if you asked me that question two years or three years ago, I would have said, you know, we have to be docile and you have to, you know, you have to be the woman in the relationship. But now that I'm experiencing something very, very differently, when that man loves you or that person loves you, they are going to celebrate you at every moment. Like my partner, he is the, the more I do, the happier he is. And that is how it's supposed to be. But we are equally yoked. So yes. I'm able to celebrate him. He celebrates me and we celebrate each other together. By the way, I'm blushing and I'm yeah. cheesing and it's not <laughs> even me. I'm just saying big ups. To you because it is difficult. It is. It is difficult to find that partner. So let us talk about your, your, your philanthropic initiatives because a lot of people might focus on the fact that you are an amazing entrepreneur and that's good because it takes cash to care. But I think what really stands out is your heart. It is your heart for people. It is your heart to give back. It is your heart not to be performative, but to actually put your, 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 your money where your mouth is, but to see the impact. Um, you've been to Jamaica. Yeah. You've, you've spoken about the needs, naturally, that's here. Um, talk to me about like, why you're here. I know you're, we only have you for a little while right now, but why are you in Jamaica and do you have any plans coming up? So I am in Jamaica today yes. because I'll be speaking at Sajikor at the Blast Off. I'm excited. Yes. And to motivate and inspire some young people and middle-aged people and older people. Uh, so that's why I'm here today. But my philanthropic efforts is near and dear to my soul mm-hmm. because I want to be not the only one. Mm-hmm. I want to be so many. I want to be in a room with a hundred other black women billionaires. Yes. I want to be able to pull, put my hand back and pull my sister next to me mm-hmm. because that is our responsibility and it is truly our duty. And by doing so, my scholarship program, I have a scholarship program where all my full scholarship kids are all Caribbean, most of which are Jamaican. And so far, all my full scholarship kids are all girls. That Doesn't mean this boys aren't included, but Correct. so far it's been girls. I have a scholarship program where I have over 340 kids that have sent to school, either partial scholarship or full scholarship. And being able to provide meals, like during the pandemic, I provided over 5 million meals for the community. Be able to provide meals with the basic necessities. One of the things that I do every Christmas, which is absolutely near and dear to my soul, and I have not been able to actually hand out the toys myself. My yes. first toy was a doll that I got from a donation at Christmas time yes. when I went to America. And because of that, everywhere that my stores are, my, one of the managers would choose one or two charities for children and we buy them Christmas toys. Yes. And it warms my heart to see how joyful they are and the fact that they don't have. And then I'm able to be in a place where I'm able to care for them and love them 
through the resources I have, but God has blessed me so that I can bless others. I think what is interesting is that uh, when you were growing up, you didn't have toys, and yet still now you are in a position to do so. Um, God and spirituality is a big part. Yes. And I've seen you say that you make time for your prayer time, your tea time, your story time with your kids. Uh, and speaking of kids, um, I believe your second child, Gabriel, Gabriel. Um, which is a, a biblical name. Um, you also say he's the, the prophet. Um, because I think it, nothing happens by chance. I don't think anything is coincidental. But you said it was Gabriel who saw exactly where your business was would have been, even if he was young and he couldn't articulate everything, just share with me those moments when he kind of sowed a seed and you lived to see it manifest. So, you know, with Gabriel, so I didn't want to have any more children after Natalia because I was focused on career. I'm, I want to gun it. I want to make sure I'm ex excellent. I want to be successful. I don't want to have more children. So Natalia was on my hip wherever I go. <laughs> after the coma, yes. I felt like Gabriel was my life's gift. I wanted a child so bad after the coma. And I was like, God saved me so that I can have this little boy. And that's why his name is Gabriel, the angel. So when he was two, two, two three years old, we're walking in. I had just started medical equipment business. We're walking in, and it's a rundown space. It's uh, nothing, nothing to look at. To Dilapidated. Look at. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, Mom, Bailey's is going to be in a large yellow building. And I said, Honey, you think so much of your poor old mama. Such a vivid imagination, son. <laughs> and my first building, my first commercial building, just happened to be in a large yellow building. And he continued on his prophetic path. And we were in CVS one night, and I had the three kids, single mom. Kayla's crying. She's an infant. Gabriel and Tala sit in the air. So he got up from the chair, and he walks over to me and says, Mom, why don't you buy one of these? And in my head, I'm like... You think so much of your poor old mama. <laughs> but he knew. He knew. And a year later, I was opening my first pharmacy. And how many pharmacies do you have now? I have, currently I have 46, soon to be uh, 53 locations. God I'm in is, the middle of opening additional ones. God is, so, God is so amazing. When you look at your life, you look at the milestones, the highs, the lows, the hills, the valleys. Is there one moment that you hold on to? It is your... Oh my gosh, this is my most priceless moment. Do you have one? And if you do, which one is it? Yeah, like, ha, 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 got you with that question. <laughs> you did get me with that question. <laughs> so many moments, I'm sure. There are, there are so many moments. Um, which one makes you smile and go, yeah, this is the one that if I had to hold on to, this would be it. You know, in my children, the excellence that they are, like wow. Gabriel is now the, the number one ninth grader in the state of Florida based on his test scores. And my Natalia, Congrats. she is just so mature and innovative. She's, yes. at the most, she's at, in the most prestigious program, University of Florida, and she excels so well. The decisions she makes with Dayton, I'm like, man, I wish I, wish I, I was had like you. <laughs> and so it makes, me, it makes me just so, so proud. And so if all the accomplishment and all the money, it's my family, Yes. My children and my close friends that surround me and my God that keeps us together. Mm -hmm. That's what really drives me. And I think that's what state keeps me who I am. Beautiful. I have three more questions um, to you for persons who, children, young adults who are always in need of financial assistance. Um, Sajikor Group and the, the Sajikor Foundation, they do adopt they do adopter school programs. They give scholarships and grants that help students who need financial assistance to actually go to the various tertiary um, schools in Jamaica. Uh, what advice do you have for them where they know that they have the potential? They, they, they see where they want to be, but sometimes they get bogged down with the fact that they just don't have the assistance. What, what advice do you have for them? Well, I, I was the same. I didn't have the financial assistance. So you have to create it. Mm. So when I was in high school, I used to get $10 a, a week. $10 a week for lunch. $10 JMD. Uh, um, no, American. US okay, dollars, just US check dollars. it. Okay, because I was like, girl, <laughs> you're kind of dark. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it was 95 cents okay. for lunch. <laughs> and I used to figure out how to save $6 every mm. week. So I've always been disciplined when it comes to financial um, finances. And then as I developed over the years, what I did was I was, you sh no matter how little you're making, you can save, save something. You have to save because that creates a discipline. And then 
I started making sure I learned financial terms. I started learning financial literacy. So two of the books that I recommend highly mm -hmm. are the stock market and the bond market. Okay. Because the bond market teaches you about the debt market. It teaches you how the economy runs, the GDP, and so forth. And the stock, the equity mar the stock market teaches you about the equity market. And it teaches you not only the stock market, but how the economy runs. And when you are become a student of learning those financial terms and learning those things, now the money that you have saved, now you can start doing something differently yeah. with. Like, yeah. for example, just a credit card. You know, I teaching my children the financial literacy. It, your credit card, if you have a credit card, you should never leave a balance on it. Because if it's a points card, they're paying you to keep their card versus you paying them huh. to keep their card. Huh. And so having that discipline, you will make sure that you are launched into the next, next stratosphere of success. Uh, and those are the small habits. There's something that you said in your book, and I, I'm going to ask you to, to, to just let us know how we can support you with your book. You said, it, you know, it is the, the small details in what you do that magnifies, you know, what is coming in the, in the future. You wrote this book, why you wrote it, and how do we support you? How do we find it? So I wrote this book because I wanted to help others. It is truly to help women, men, and I don't recommend my book for children 14 and under. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot of trauma in there. Correct. And I wanted to show each person that no matter what circumstances you're in, you can truly overcome. Mm -hmm. You can create your own path and you can create your own destiny of success no matter what your circumstances are. As a single mom, as a woman, as an abused woman, as an abused child into a woman or man, you can truly become exactly what you want if you keep your blinders on yes. and you remain disciplined. How to support it? It is on Amazon. Yes, ma'am. And I believe that it's here in a store in Jamaica. I got to figure out what store that is. I think, I think we, well, we checked Kingston Bookstore, but I think that they're actually coming in um, shortly. So we know that we will have your hard copy. And I know that you also have Audible and it's your voice yes. that narrates it as well. Yes. So you can have it on Kindle or Audible or, or, or the, the hardcover or softcover book. Book. Any more books in the future? You know, everyone has been talking yeah. about the next book. So the, the advice is some say, okay, you got to do the relationship book. <laughs> and then others say you got to do the, do the business development book. So uh, possibly. There's so many. Possibly. There are really so many. Um, I think what you've managed to do, you've managed to show us that we can heal. Mm -hmm. I think you've managed to show us that, there, that it's our choice yeah. whether we want to pass it on. So the final question I will ask you is... What is your definition of redirection from your eyes, your perspective, redirection? What's your definition? So my definition of redirection would be changing the path that you are on if it's not a successful path so that you can become exactly what you want to become. Mm. So if you're someone who always see the first thing you see when you look at someone or something, you see a negative, redirect your thoughts. Find the positive in that person. So if that person have a beautiful earring on, that's what you focus on. If that person have a beautiful suit on, focus on that. They have a beautiful smile, focus on that. So because whenever you, you redirect your mind to be positive, mm -hmm. what naturally would happen, you start gravitating and people who are positive start gra gravitating towards you and that your level of success become easier than it would have been because you're not bottling yourself down with all the negative things that surround you. Mm -hmm. I thank you so very much. I know that you are an extremely busy lady. I know that your team has you, you know, scheduled. Um, I want to thank Sajikor uh, simply because the group always tries to bring in amazingly impactful, meaningful persons, speakers who are not just great entrepreneurs, but who are also great philanthropists so that when they do speak to the rest of the team, the team understands that even when you're thinking about profit, you need to be thinking about people as well. And I'm so happy that you'll be here for their blast off. You're going to enjoy yourself. Um, thank you for all of your efforts and thank you for allowing other people to mirror who they could one day be. You are Maven, you are Maverick, you are Mother, you are a woman of God, and we thank you for being a living example, really and truly. And thank you thank for you. being in the redirection seat. I couldn't have asked for a better guest today, and all the best for the new year.
Thank you. You're, Thank you. You're, I am so honored. You're welcome. So you guys know, I don't want you to get all excited. Remember, season three has not yet officially started, but this was a very, very special feature that we had to do. We had to sit down with the great Dr. Trisha Bailey just to have an idea of what that redirection journey looked like, that trajectory. And it was not possible without my friends there at Sajakor Group. We wish you guys all the best for 2024. I know that Sigma Run is coming up February. 18 we're gonna do that on our run we're going to support the beneficiaries i see that you're doing danny williams um school for the for the deaf the national chess hospital which i'm grateful for because i'm, I'm asthmatic the national chess hospital has saved me on a couple of times as a child and so we thank you so very much sajikor for always creating space like this where there is impact and there is meaning so thank you again for watching redirection with terry Carell. special edition of the Redirection with Terry Carell podcast is powered by Sagicore.